just felt like maybe I should come up and speak from my heart. Um, we have to pass House Resolution 3543, number one, first and foremost. Obviously, I, I totally support that. Uh, the plight of the first responders is something that, to me as an American, is so shameful, the way we're treating these heroes. It is so uh, inhuman. And to me, the first responder issue and, and how important it is for us to make sure that these men, these women, uh, get the help that they need. Uh, it, it is a symbiont, uh, almost, there's a reciprocity between that issue and the truth about 9-11. A government that will tell you that air is safe to breathe after a national emergency when they know that there's asbestos and mercury floating around in the air, a government that will deny first responders, deny them the uh, access to respirators and things that could protect them while they're working in a situation like that, is a government that has absolutely no regard for human life. If they do something like that just to open Wall Street three days after the 9-11 attacks, knowing the health risk that they were exposing people to over the course of the next four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and onward weeks, as these men, brave men and women were working on the pile, searching for their brothers and sisters, in the case of the firefighters and the construction workers, you know, it's not a far leap to think that they would have actually pulled off the attack themselves. You know, obviously they're psychopathic sadists with absolutely no regard for human life, who put profit over people, who have the audacity. Watching every 9-11 that approaches, every time there's a, uh, you know, we, we commemorate the day, watching the event that they, that they telecast from Ground Zero is one of the most difficult parts of the day for me, not just because of the obvious, the memories that it brings back of what happened on that day, but watching. You know that there's somebody sitting back, some media executive, some, uh, some military uh, intelligence expert, some, some people on the inside are sitting back watching that event knowing that they themselves had a hand in carrying it off and planning it. In, in, in murdering the very people. Just the, the sand that it takes, you know, to be that callous is something that is hard for most thinking, feeling human beings to understand, but it must exist. I mean, obviously the people who, who gave the order to report the collapse of Building 7 an hour before it fell down, you know, they're, they're, they're involved in the telecast that happens every single, every single year, right? CNN. Uh, to name one, um, it's, it's just, you know, and, and in a situation like this, with the exception of the people who are watching as we're, you know, as we're going live over the net and stuff, I mean, obviously everybody here knows this. Everybody here understands this. Uh, I, do, I do know that there are varying, I don't mean any disrespect because I know that there are some first responders who don't who don't necessarily agree with, you know, the inside job scenario, but, you know, you listen to Richard Gage, uh, talk about the 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 art his you know the architecture of destruction for instance uh, his presentation on the collapse the controlled demolition of of the towers I mean it leaves very little doubt for speculation I mean it's obvious it's obvious what they did and the agenda that's unfolding now is the agenda that they announced before the attacks even began and in the in in the interim they've stolen elections I mean they're just shameless in context. And this is something that I guess I wanted to say. Contextually, you know, I'm watching a lot of my friends. I don't have a lot of friends in Hollywood, per se, but I have, you know, a lot of friends in the acting community. And a lot of them are very, very pro-Obama to the point where it's like, you know, almost like this blind, irrational, unthinking kind of just Obama's going to save this country. Even if the man, I can't judge Barack Obama, and I'm not, and I'm not, uh, definitely, certainly not a McCain fan. What I'm saying is, at this point, the choices that we're left with, right? And it seems that the obvious choice must be the savior, Barack Obama. Even if the man's heart is pure and he means what he says and his beautiful rhetorical, you know, speeches about change and, and hope and this, that, and the other, and I hope he does, the problems that we, our country faces, that this world faces, are systemic ills. You know, a new man, one person, and a new administration is not going to change the systemic <laughs> problem. Right? 
So we find ourselves then in a situation where maybe cosmetically for three or four months it's going to look as if to the rest of the world, oh God, finally America made the right choice. They made the right decision. They're showing, the American people are showing by their votes that count that, you know, that they want change. Well, if then two or three months down the line, you know, he continues to advance the same militarist corporate agenda that we've seen for the last 20, uh, God, last decades, right? Uh, then what, what, what does it all mean? Where's the change, you know? Where's the change? And if we're gonna measure the man by his actions as opposed to his words, you know, what happened to the, the, the public financing of your campaign? You know, why did you say that, you know, why did you advocate that but then decide to take corporate money at the end of the day? I mean, again, I can't judge the man, I don't know his heart, but Obama will not save you. Obama will not save you. We must save ourselves. We have to save ourselves. Now, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what that means in practical terms. You know what I mean? Like, I can think about this, I understand it, I understand that contextually then, what that means contextually is that this whole dog and pony show of, a, of an election is ultimately just orchestrated theater to keep us uh, the, from the left to the right, and oh, you know, Paul didn't make it in, oh, my candidate, you know, we, we got Cynthia McKinney running, and God bless Cynthia McKinney. God bless Cynthia McKinney. That's who I'm voting for. That's who I'm voting for. You know, that's a woman <laughs> I, that I'm absolutely going to vote for Cynthia McKinney. She's somebody who stands up for the truth with absolutely no fear, uh, even in the face of death threats, you know. But, you know, and she's obviously intelligent enough to know that, again, we're facing systemic problems. So her running is going to make a statement, gives us, as people who want to be conscientious with our vote, a box to check where we feel like we're voting for something that actually matters as opposed to just playing into, again, this well-orchestrated theater of, of an election. Um, and, you know, all of these things, again, contextually, the lies that they told about the air quality and the, and the, the risk that they put the hero first responders, the, the risk that they put their lives at, you know, the, the fact that it's not a far jump to, to, to see then, especially with the overwhelming amount of smoking guns that are stacked so high on top of one another that they block out the light of the sun, that our government had a direct hand in participating in the 9-11 attacks and in murdering American civilians to advance a war plan agenda. And then the absolute meaninglessness, really, I hate to say it, of the election right now and even the electoral process. I mean, I, it's like, what are we left with? What are we left with? What can we give them other than an utter vote of absolute no competence? No competence whatsoever. I mean, look, I, I mean, to go back with the Barack Obama thing just for a second, I want to believe that this brother is going to make a change. I want to believe that he means what he says. And when he talks to me, I feel like, man, I feel you. You are charismatic. You are a good speaker. He speaks well extemporaneously. He seems to mean what he says, but then he wants to pull Zbigniew Brzezinski over to his side as his foreign policy advisor, right? Precisely, you know, the architect of everything that's going on right now, of everything that's going on right now in the Middle East. Alan Goolsby is gonna bring him close to him. So the people that the man is surrounding himself, either he's totally oblivious to the fact that he has the most wicked of the wicked in high places coming, you know, like incubi and succubi surrounding him and he just has absolutely no idea. And if that's the case, then I want to volunteer to be one of his personal bodyguards because he's going to get it. Like, you know, like Caesar got it from Brutus. I mean, then he's going to get it. The, you know, if that's the case, if he's that oblivious. Or he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing and the agenda in which he's participating. I mean, at the same, you know, the, in the same breath that he'll say, we have to, I want to end the war. And I was, I was against the war from the beginning and we want to bring our troops home. But then he'll say, we have to stay tough on terror, though. And um, we can't allow Iran to become a nuclear threat. No, that's absolutely unacceptable. And we have to, you know, uh, make sure that we continue the hunt for Osama bin Laden and go find, you know, get after Al Qaeda. I mean, dude, you're obviously not that stupid. How could you be that stupid? So you must be running game, dog. You gotta be running game. You know, but again, I don't wanna judge. You know what I mean? I don't know the brother, I don't know his heart. McCain, obviously, I mean, I'm not even going to waste my breath talking about that <laughs> Manchurian idiot. But um, so, 
you know, I, 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 again, I have to applaud. I do this every time they hand me a microphone. I have to applaud Luke, We Are Change, uh, Dylan, and all the guys from Louder Than Words. And, yeah, the Gary Franchies of the world. Maybe he's watching from Chicago with the Lone Lantern Society. I mean, God bless you, Aaron Russo. We miss you, and Alex Jones. And everybody who's doing this kind of very necessary very necessary work. Dissent is the most, you know, is the most prime example of, of what it means to be a patriot in, a, in an aspiring democratic society. We cannot allow them to take away our rights of freedom of speech, uh, to gather and assemble like this, and we have to come up with some kind of an agenda. You know, I, I hate that feeling after a march or a gathering where we're like, yeah, okay, back to work, back to, I don't know, back to my daily life, you know. Um, <sighs> Uh, you know, what are the what are the answers? You know, how can we start saying stop saying they and start? I want to see arrests. I want to see perp walks. I want to see war crimes tribunals. I want justice, man. That's what I want. And you know, in an ideal sense, you know, in in a, in a utopian ideal kind of like, I can see hundreds of years maybe in the future that we could all, you know, get along and like live together as one and we could have kind of like what would look like, you know, kind of like a, it see, you know, I'm not like one world government, one world religion, I'm not advocating that at all, but what I'm saying is that the logical extension of us all loving one another and honoring our differences while at the same time, you know, uh, making choices that are based on a, on a universal morality. Um, it's gonna be a world that kind of looks like that. You're talking about like a utopian society. If there's some kind of quantum leap that could happen in our consciousness, and I feel like we're so close, and I'm hoping it's not gonna take an asteroid or a mushroom cloud or something horrific that, that dwarfs 9-11 and makes that look like, you know, like, uh, like child's play. I'm hoping it's not gonna take something catastrophic. I don't want it to be that. I want, you know, I want a peaceful revolution. I would just love, you know, we could just like look at each other, and wouldn't it be great if over in Darfur they were like, I don't have to kill these people, you know, just put the guns down and you know, it's, it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. <laughs> From a certain, and I understand it sounds like an emotionally potent oversimplification, but it's, it's really not. That's, that is truth. That's like, that's what Bob was talking about. That's why we still sing those songs, right? Uh, <laughs> The emotionally potent oversimplifications is the stuff that they're feeding us on, you know, on that blue TV screen that we're all stay so glued to. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of riffs, but I mean, I know you guys feel me. Uh, we are change. We have to be the change that we want to see in the world. That's the point. Yeah. So I'm gonna wrap it up right now. I am so excited. I wanna say I am so excited that later on tonight, KRS-One, Talib Kweli, you know, representatives of real hip hop, right? Because it is a music of rebellion, resistance, a music of the people. I can't wait for them to grace the stage. Uh, I, I just wanna send my respect and my personal thank you to all first responders who are in the house tonight. Uh, just as a, a citizen of New York, a citizen of this country, we honor you, we love you, we respect you. We are sorry for the, the illnesses that you guys are coming down with, and we're gonna continue working to help you guys get the help that you need. Um, love you all, peace.